Y'all already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life. And we're back. Just because your guard don't make you better than nobody. A lot of them guards was in the streets when they was young, committing crimes, just didn't get caught. A lot of these guards I met didn't abide by the same rules and laws that were laid down in the prison. There are certain things that we can't do that they can do, which is expected. We're being punished. But there's certain prison you know, rules that we can't do and they can't do either. I met some good guards. I met some bad guards. I had some guards that hated me. I hated them. Could be for me saying something out the way, them coming out of pocket and saying something to me, the way they treated me. It could be anything. But I had quite a few guards in the past I did not like for whatever reason. But throughout the years, all the years of where my stupidity landed my dumb ass, i seen some dumb things, man, especially when it comes to the guards and them thinking that because there was these rules in place, they didn't have to follow them. Let me tell you what happens when they don't follow them. Let me give you a couple stories on some of these idiots that thought they could slide below the radar when nobody else was looking. Y'all know I done seen it. Y'all know I done lived it. So let's relive it. I could probably write a whole book on correctional officers, guards, turnkeys, whatever you want to call them. They were some of the nastiest people I ever met. Man. When it comes to like breaking it down for you on some of these dudes, it would be a book. But some of them stick out in my mind. Today I got three stories for y'all on shitty ass officers, the shitty things they did, and their shitty demise, watching them lose their jobs, watching them get fired. You don't ever want to see somebody lose their job. When somebody comes to work and their job is to make your life a living hell, like they literally don't come there to be a guard. They come there on an ego trip, a power trip. Like they are just, you know, down on you for no reason. <laughs> on the day you see them leave, it's Glad you're gone, right? First dude was an older dude, older black man. He had the weirdest last name, probably. If, it's in the top five of weird names I've seen. But it was like Grozol, Grozolowski or something. It was so hard. It was like Y's and Z's and K's and just letters that didn't belong in last names that you know we were used to. So we all just called him G. Officer G. C-O-G, some people called him COG because, you know, C-O-G. But for the most part, we just called him Officer G, right? This dude to say was power tripping was an understatement. He was every bit of pushing 60 years old when he walked into my pile for the first time. I don't know if he was a guard prior to this. I don't know if he came from another prison another part of the prison we were in I just know this miserable old son of a bitch showed up where we were at when we first you know when he first showed up you'd look at his name tag you'd be like what the hell did you, could, could, could grow his all? What, what did your name tag say and he'd pronounce it and you would try to pronounce it and he'd be like that's not how you say my name so we just started calling him COG or Officer G right soon as dude gets in there he starts writing people up and for y'all don't know, a prison write-up, they have an inmate rule book. It's a book that all inmates must abide by. You got what's called a 200 series. 200 series charge is like, it's equivalent to a misdemeanor in the streets. And you got 100 series, which is equivalent to a felony, which can be everything from, you know, possession of drugs to a knife to murder the more serious charges. This guy's whole mission in working in the Department of Corrections was to see how many, you know, infractions, charges he could write inmates. He's like that state trooper that pulls you over for going one mile over the speed limit. And it's, not oh, ain't gonna be no breaks today. You don't speed my state. He was one of those guys. Not to mention, 
he was old. When I say old, like, I'm not talking about his age. I'm talking about just his appearance. Like, he looked like he had been drinking beer since he was about seven. And the only thing that ever gained weight on him was his stomach. He's shaped like one of them little worm guys from Men in Black, right? So he's got a chip on his shoulder. Never has nothing nice to say. There are some officers that come in, how you doing today? That, you know, are just pleasant people. Just one of those guys that no matter what happened, he always, at all points in the day, looked like he was chewing on shit flavor bubble gum. It wouldn't take long for me and this dude to bump heads, man. G's walking through the pod one day and I'm standing in my homeboy's doorway and you're not allowed to go in other people's cells. That's how they cut back on, I guess, stealing. That's how they cut back on gang activity. They cut back on drug uses. If we see you in somebody else's cell, you're gonna get a charge. They have a yellow line drawn at the door that if you're standing past that yellow line, it's called a 229. That is the code for the charge you're going to get. It's an unauthorized area. Me and, me, me and COG get off to a bad start. Man. He's been in our pod a good three, four days now. Comes He goes off, his shift ends, and they go like two days on, three days off, three days on, two days off. That's how they rotate. They don't do five days, seven days. It's just what I told you. I have a neighbor that lives in the cell right next to me. The guy that lives in the cell next to me. And at the time, you could still smoke in prison. So he had asked me for some tobacco. I said, yeah, I'll bring you over some. So I go over to his cell. And I'm standing in his doorway. This little, probably three-foot doorway. Not even. It might be 32 inches, 30 inches. And I'm standing there with my back in the doorway. And I'm not in this guy's cell. I'm just standing there. I just gave him tobacco, which is also... Another thing you can't do is transfer any type of personal items, commissary, and get a charge for that, right? G comes in, and he sees me hand the guy something. And instead of walking down the line of sales, looking at everybody's sales, and then doing his turn at the corner and coming to where I'm at, when he sees me stick my hand in, and I lean my back against the door frame, he beelines straight across the pod to where I'm at. What'd you just give him? By now, the guy's taking the tobacco laid it on the counter and dumped it out, you know, I'll give him nothing. Step out the way. What? I didn't give him nothing. Step out the way. I step out the way. He goes in and proceeds to tear in this dude. There was an old dude living in the cell next to me at the time. Proceeds to just shaking this man's cell down and making a mess of this man's cell. Most of the tobacco, probably an ounce or two of tobacco I gave the dude, got knocked off the counter. Other stuff got mixed in with it. This dude just went in there and just went ham just went nuts in this dude's cell thinking like he had really just like caught like el chapo passing off a brick or something all i did was get an old man some you know something to smoke man so he steps out get up against the wall get up against the wall by now he's called another officer starts patting me down searching my pockets i said i don't i don't have anything i didn't hand him anything which i did but he was like I saw you, I'm like, you didn't see me do anything. I reached in the door, dabbed dude up, and was talking to him. This guy was so petty that as he was walking away from my neighbor, if you want to call it cell, I had one foot over the yellow line. I was like, man, dude was tripping, man. My bad, man. I should have, I ain't even seen him come in, man. That's my bad. He looks back, sees my foot over the yellow line, and does like an about face. If you know what the military and about face means. He does like a whoop, looks, looks over his shoulder, sees me, and just like whole body just spins 180. Walks back to over on Matt and he goes, go ahead and let me get your ID. And you have this prison ID that's, you know, if you're going out and about, it's supposed to be clipped to your pocket. If not, it's just in your pocket or in your cell, wherever. I said, I ain't got my ID on me. Oh, you ain't got your ID? What's your name? This dude didn't even, hadn't paid enough attention to me, even though that I lived in the cell directly next to this. I said, Williams. What's your first initial? J. What's your inmate number? 1188376. What cell you sleep in? Cell directly next to 21. Why? What's up? You're in an unauthorized area. What do you mean I'm in an unauthorized area? Your foot, you're inside that man's cell. You're not allowed to be in there. I said, man, stop playing with me right now. Do not play with me. Stop. Huh? Oh, yeah, you're getting a charge. You're going to read about it. That's what they always say. You're going to read about it. He writes me up. Sure enough, I get called upstairs. 
We're going to, you know, issue a $5 fine, two weeks loss of commissary. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. These little things like this can add up to messing up your good time. These little, small, stupid, petty charges can change the day I go home. It can make it to where I don't get home to my son on the date I'm supposed to, which I've already done that several times. So my date's done changed several times because of my stupidity in the past. But he's writing these petty charges that are going to change my release date. I might spend another five days in here because you said my foot was over the line. So I told him, I, you know, I take my little plea bargain. Now, I don't like COG. Do not like Officer G, Turnkey G, Razulaskalaskis, ZZZ, whatever his name was. Did not like the dude, man. So when he would come through, everybody knew when this man came through, he would write you. He would walk straight over to where people were playing poker at. Tell them, get up, check their pockets, and make sure they ain't have no poker chips. Like, dudes that got smart, we had ways around it. I'm not going to get into it. But the poker chips are right there. Everybody knew when a shift came on, it's like, man, we got to deal with this dude today. This whole entire idiot. Gets to a point where when he walks by my cell, rather than just walk by, he would like to stop and make a little slick comments. What you got going on in there? What you doing in there today? So I'm being locked up, bitch. What's it look like I'm doing? Like, come on, man. Go on somewhere. I ain't got time to play, man. I'm not one of your great, great grandchildren. Like, carry your ass on, man. Go bother somebody else. I ain't doing nothing. Man. I'm just sitting there watching TV. Uh-huh. I'll be back. Don't worry about it. Me and this dude bump heads. By now, this dude has done wrote me all these different charges. The beauty in the matter was, with me being the maintenance man, there was times I could get upstairs and slide in the sergeant's office. And I would grab G's whole entire stack of charges. He wrote everybody, roll that shit up, shove it down in front of my pants, and it would never make it to the sergeant's lieutenant, so nobody would get wrote up, right? I did this a bunch of times. Dudes used to be like, Yo, I will pay you to get this charge off, off that desk, man. Is there any way you can get in the sergeant's office? And like I said, when we be in the maintenance, man, I would be able to slide up in there sometimes. Might go up in there with a, a little rookie CO sitting up in there just bullshitting, be like, hey, they had told me earlier somebody's computer keeps shutting off. Let me check the electrical wire and stuff. And hey, I'm gonna need you to move out. I need to move this chair. And that was the power I had with the little bullshit prison job I had, right? I knew something was off with dudes because there was days he would come in and he would be worse than he was any time other. Like it was like almost like this man looked like he was on the verge of having a stroke while walking. He was just struggling. Struggling. I'm at the same exact cell, a couple weeks down the line. Standing there, talking to the dude that lives in my cell, in the cell next to me, older gentleman. He didn't mess with a lot of people. He was about his business. Been down a long time, never going home. I like talking to the dude. The dude had a lot of wisdom. You know, I gave him a lot of respect. I learned a lot from him. So I would just chop it up with this old man, you know, here and there. G comes in, is walking, does his rounds, and I see him, and I'm talking to the dude, and I look up, because I heard the door pop, and I seen him when he come in, I look down, my foot's not under, under the line, right, it's not over the line, so I said, okay, I'm not doing anything wrong, I can stand at the door and talk, G's coming my way, I said, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and back up, that way, me and dude don't, you know what I mean, he don't bump into me, or try to make some bullshit charge, but right in front of cell 21, there's a staircase that goes up to the second level. So I back out of his way and back underneath the staircase to let the this piece of shit officer go by. And when I step under the staircase, he goes, huh, just caught you, unauthorized area. What the fuck you mean I'm in an unauthorized area? I moved out your way. He's like, not allowed to congregate or be underneath the staircase. That's a 229 unauthorized area. I said, man, you got to be fucking kidding me. I said, look, man, I'm getting about tired of you writing me these fucking charges, man. Like, oh, what, what is that? Is that a threat? Are you threatening me? Are you what, what do you, you want to run up and do something to me? I said, man, whatever. Man, get your clown ass the fuck out of here. Write your charge. Stick it in your ass. I don't care what you do. You know what I mean? I just I spaz out on doing. He's walking away, and as he's walking away, I'm like, fucking clown. Turns around, comes back, and gets right up in my face. At the moment he got in my face, I realized what had been going on with this dude the whole time. We had never gotten that close for me to be able to smell him or him to be able to smell me. When he got in my face, that dude reeked of alcohol. That dude smelled like 
He took a bath in Jack Daniels and rinsed his mouth out with, you know, Hennessy. Like, dude just reeked of liquor. So he's standing there running his mouth, and I was like, damn, bro, you need to brush your teeth or something. Get your funky ass out of my face, man. Like, you stink, man. You smell like a whole entire trunk. No wonder you be riding around here so mad. You hung over. Like, fucking with people, man. Why don't you go find you a chair somewhere and a couple gallons of water and sit down and leave people to fuck alone? You know what I mean? I get called up for my charge. Other dudes telling me, man, you need to put his drunk ass on blast. I said, Telling's telling, huh? Even if you tell on, even if I tell on him, that's still telling. You can't like pick sides on who is cool to tell on or who ain't cool to tell on. Like, if you're gonna tell on him, you'll tell on the next man. I said, nah, I'm gonna wear my little bullshit charge. I go up there, the lieutenant at the time knows me, the sergeant's not on. It's a nighttime thing where they brought me up there for that charge. And I told the lieutenant what happened. I said, then he got, he also wrote me up for cursing abuse. Uh, it was like three or four charges. And I told him, I said, a man was walking by, backed out the way, stepped underneath the staircase. Then he started, you know, running his mouth. Somebody's going to give me an unauthorized area. I was only there to get out of his way so he could do his job and keep his ass moving. Get up out of here, you know what I mean? The lieutenant throws the charges out. No, nah, I'm not going to process these. These are bullshit. Yes, I said, had he not had even, you know, started messing with me about being underneath the staircase, we'd have never gotten to the verbal altercation. None of that would have ever happened. And he's saying, that's not what happened. You came out underneath the staircase, running your mouth. I said, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I was running my mouth because, you know what I mean? You was, you was, you was pressing me, like, talking about some dumbass charges again. Stop writing me up, man. Like, what is your issue? G would walk through there and dudes would be like, hey, COG, I need a request for him. Ah, that's not what I'm in here to do. I'm just coming through to make sure everybody's alive and ain't nobody doing nothing they don't need to do. And if I got to write some charges, that's what I'm going to do. If you need a request for him, talk to the officer in the booth. Dudes will be like, hey, man, my cell needs medical. Do I look like a doctor to you? I'm not a doctor. I'm a guard. You need to talk to somebody else. That ain't my job, right? This goes on for months with this dude. I'm stressed to the point that He's got me so angry over things we, we done bumped heads with and all these dumbass charges he's wrote me in the past that I'm at the point now, I'm like, man, something's got to shake, man. If something don't shake with this dude, he don't somehow get up out of here, I'm going to end up putting hands on this man, and that's five years. You hit that guard, go ahead and know you just took another five years, dropped it in your backpack, and that's what you're going to wear. You're going to do them five years for hitting that guard, right? One day comes around where everybody knows we're like, COG supposed to be on the day. Supposed to be on the day. We hear the door pop first thing in the morning. They they just call it standby for child. Standby for first call for movement, for school. Blah, blah, blah. All these different things. And we hear the door pop. And in walks a guard we ain't never seen before. A guard that actually other guys knew. Cool guard came to the other side of the compound, right? And I'm like, nine. Yes, we ain't got COG today. He's not in here. I don't care why he's not in here. I don't care. I'm just glad he's not here. Nah, don't talk him up. Don't talk him up. Yeah, you're right. Let's just let's just live our best life as, as long as we can with what we got going on, right? That guard that came in was super cool, super chill. He goes on to tell us that the day before we were locked down, and you locked down for like lunch, you locked down for different things. Just different things. You have to lock down for count. And the warden, they come through. And the warden was walking with some people from a program that were coming to look at the prison and what they had going on. And COG is in the control booth. The warden is outside of the main gate that's got to let him into, like, the pods, the two pods that call the best of you, Sally Port. And once you open that gate and it slides open, these bars slide open, you step in directly in front of you as a control booth with a door that opens where you can go up in the control booth if you're a guard or have that power. And then there's two sliding doors with bars to your left and your right that slide open that lets you in either which way you're going. The warden is standing there with these people and he goes on, he gets on his microphone, tells him, hey, Officer G, open the Sally Port door. Officer G don't respond. Officer G opens the Sally Port door. Officer G doesn't respond. He's sitting in the chair with his back to him. Now the warden's banging on the glass. And this man's just sitting. He's 
Officer Grazalozhwaski, open the door. He just keeps sitting there. They go over to the elevator, get on the elevator, go to the second floor, come out the second floor. Now the doors at the end of the top tiers have a key you can put in and unlock. They unlock the door, the warden walks through the top tier with these people, comes down the staircase. Now he's inside the pod and going to the side of the control booth where there's a little hole and you can see it's all wrapped in glass and you can see the guard sitting in there. Warden walks up, bangs on the glass. Oh, hey, 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 what's going on? Why didn't you answer the radio? I had to bring these people all the way through the, through the elevator on the second floor around to get down in the control booth. Oh, man, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear my radio. It's clear he was just asleep. Somebody could have been getting killed. That car, that warden could have been getting murdered. Those people could have been, been murdered. Somebody could have been out there cell. And he's in there just asleep. Now the warden has told him, pop the door, goes up to the control booth. It's going to show the people that he's brought with him the operations, the control panel, all the lights, what these buttons do, panic buttons, the spray they spray you with, all these different things, right? Just showing the control booth. And I guess that the inside of the control booth reeked of alcohol. They take this old son of a bitch out, and just like they would give us drug tests. They could give us breathalyzers if need be, if they thought you were intoxicated. They take him to the third floor. He refuses. He tells him, I can't believe y'all would come at me like this, blah, blah. This is all what this, this cool guard told us, right? Can't believe y'all would come at me like this. Just running his mouth because the man is intoxicated. To make it worse, the next officer that they take G out the control booth, leading to the front of the compound, fire him. Well, actually, they told him that he was going to be put under review. They were going to look into this and blah, blah, blah. Pretty much you're fired. That's their way of saying get out of here without there being a conflict. The next officer that comes in the booth, because they have to have somebody take over his station once he leaves. And G would always, when you'd see him in the booth, he'd come out with a trash bag with napkins, brown paper towels, paperwork, all the stuff balled up in it. The next officer that comes in the booth finds this small, empty, clear plastic bottle of liquor sitting in the trash can sealed old mr g's fate cog is up out of here now they're wondering was he bringing liquor in for the inmates because if he snuck this in for himself could have snuck it in for the next man we can't drink but he can get drunk walk around here and call shots all day a lot of dudes started pushing paperwork wanting little bullshit charges that he had wrote up overturned and y'all had a drunk man writing people up how did y'all not know that man was drunk? How did y'all hire that man? He looked like a drunk. Oh, Ned DeWano looking at us like he breaks into cars and sleeps in the back seat for the night and then goes on to work. Talk about a happy day. Man, that was one of the greatest days ever. CNO, COG, Grazalabrowski, get the hell up out of there. Oh, drunk ass. And I hope you see this. And I hope your bum ass is unemployed. But in all reality, I hope you got some help, man. Crazy, crazy thing. I can't tell you how happy I was to see COG leave, man. Thank God he left. You see how much time I got left. Got time for one more, man. I was going to give y'all three, but I, I took too long on that first one. Unless I chop and screw it, you know, we can get the second one in. Sergeant Whitfield. Anybody was ever up GRCC? knows who Sergeant Whitfield was. Sergeant Whitfield was like a grown-ass skinny kid, but didn't look young in the face. Face was weathered, old, just nasty looking old man. Like he had like, his teeth were so dirty. That he, like he had George Washington teeth in. Like he had dentures made of wood. Like they molded his teeth out of cardboard and just put that in his mouth. Like he had some old scraggly ass, just the dirtiest teeth, man. This dude had a complex at being maybe 5'8", 160, 165 pounds. He had that Napoleon complex. And he was a sergeant, so he walked around all day with his shoulders bent back and his chest poked out, like trying to look like he was big. Like one of the type of dudes that would put on like six hoodies to make themselves look big. 
That was Whitfield, but he was really just this little scrawny, loudmouth, obnoxious ass guard. And at the time that Whitfield was there, the, the rapper Chameleon there was out, right? And he had, this, he had this song, Riding Dirty. They see me rolling. You know what I mean? That joint. Whitfield, you could be coming out of Chow Hall, and Whitfield be standing there smoking his long ass Salem 100s, right? Smoking his cigarettes. You walk by, he'd be like, hey, come here. I know you riding dirty. I know you riding dirty. Come here. And he'd shake you down, pat you down around the boulevard. That was his famous thing. He'd he walk in the pod. I know y'all riding dirty. I know y'all riding dirty. I'm in here. And he just walked through cells. And if he seen anything, it didn't have to be anything wrong. You could just be standing in your cell with your back turned to him. He's going to walk in there and look around you to see what you're doing. What you doing? Like, man, I'm just standing here making something to eat. Whitfield chain smoked. Whitfield would be walking through the pod. Like I said, you could smoke in prison at this time. So Whitfield be walking through the pod with that long ass cigarette hanging out of his mouth, just on shift. Very unprofessional, right? He'd be sitting in the office, smoking cigarettes back to back, back to back, back to back, outside the chow hall, outside the gym. You might see him on the rec yard. He was there at nighttime sometimes and didn't even work night shift. He would just be in there, hadn't gone home yet. We come to find out Sergeant Whitfield also has a wife that works at the prison, but she works on the other side of the prison. I'm in S3, which is a whole entire unit by itself, separated by a bunch of fences, no way to get to the next part of the prison or the first part of the prison. Well, his wife worked in S1, he worked in S3. 2010, they take smoking out of prison. Now, that didn't just affect us guys that smoke. It didn't just affect the, the prison politics and the prison money. And, you know, cigarettes was a big currency. If you owed somebody a lot of money, say you ran a gambling pool and you got hit on a parlay ticket, a parlay ticket is a slip, you know, that guys make up based on basketball, football, it's, you know, like, like Vegas odds. They pass out these slips, and if you got hit on it by somebody in another building, you'd have to take that money out to the yard. Cigarettes were great because if you owed somebody $100, $200, you know, for them winning on this gambling ticket, you can take out a couple boxes of cigarettes, tuck them in your shirt, cover it up, and nobody can see it. Now when they take commissary out, ain't nobody trying to take $200 in stamps. You're not about to pay me the money you owe me with $200 in stamps. So dudes would have to have like five or six guys now smuggle this commissary out on the yard to give to this dude, and then this guy's got to pass it off to all these different people to get it back in the building. This ain't snitching, they know this shit. If, if you think they don't know it, you're tripping, because I got caught plenty of times, right? So when they took cigarettes out, it didn't just mean that we couldn't buy it or we couldn't smoke. It meant tobacco products were not allowed to be smoked on, on the prison premises. That goes for us, that goes for the guards, that goes for everybody. Your visitors, if they pulled up in the parking lot and were standing outside their car smoking a cigarette and a guard seen them, they would tell them you need to put that out. You're not allowed to smoke on prison grounds, right? Even after they shut down smoking, here's the thing if you're not a smoker or no one around you smokes, you can smell it a mile away. Now you walk, some, walk by somebody just smoked a cigarette. If you don't smoke cigarettes, you be like, damn, he stinks like cigarettes. Whitfield didn't just stink like cigarettes. Whitfield smelled like he had a pocket full of half-smoked cigarettes at all given times. This is after they taken smoking out the prison, right? I'm on the third floor one day doing something and I'm coming down the staircase. I was up there working and I look out the window, the front of the building is solid, you know, plexiglass, big thick glass. I look out and I see Whitfield and he's over standing at the corner of the fence in the other building and he's smoking a cigarette. I said, man, look at this son of a bitch, man. You no know, bad, I want a cigarette like, man, they ain't took smoking out. This bitch is just out there smoking like it's cool, right? He would come through shortly after, reeking of cigarettes. Everybody knows Whitfield ain't giving a shit about these little, you not going to smoke, he's going to continue to smoke. And like I said, he smoked these Salem 100s. Whitfield standing out front of the chow hall one day, dude comes out, he says, I know you're riding dirty, I know you're riding dirty, I see you, I see you, come here, come here, come here. And the dude comes over there and Whitfield searches the guy, the guy's got some oranges on him. Most likely he's going to make some wine. And it ain't a lot. It's like five, six oranges. But Phil says, what's your name? Give me your ID. Reaches in his pocket to pull out his 
little pad and his little he got like a little flip pad and a, and a pen pulls a shirt pen off his shirt pocket reaches in his pocket to pull out the little pad and when he does his pack of cigarettes falls out and hits the ground we're coming out the chow hall like, i'm just coming through the door with a bunch of other guys another guy i know it's a couple of guys in front of me when we see it hit the ground i'm like i know he heard that everybody's looking winfield's got his back turned and he's writing this guy's name and his state number down we'll give him an institutional charge for stealing from the chow hall contraband you know just dumb little bullshit right dude looks around and no other guards looking nobody else seen it but the inmates snatched the pack of cigarettes up puts them in his pocket right now when they feed in the chow hall they release certain pods at a time to keep us and these people and all these different people from mixing together they'll let out like our pod and when our pod's almost done and we're about finished eating, they'll let the next pod out and they'll come in right behind us, right? Whitfield realizes the cigarettes are missing. He knows the last pod that was in his seven building 100 pod. Just called 200, cigarettes already gone. Had to be somebody out of seven building 100 pod. We're in there just doing what we're doing. I hear the door pop. Shkling. Here he walks in. He walks in the middle of the pod and he says, Whoever's got what belongs to me, better give it up. You better give it up. I'm not playing. Otherwise, everybody in this bitch is riding dirty. We'll come in and we'll tear it up. Everybody knew what he was talking about because dude is already, you know, and the dude that got the cigarettes didn't smoke. So he's in the midst of selling these things. You know what I mean? $5, $10. He's like selling these. We call them Cadillacs. He's selling these Cadillacs off as quick as he, as quick as he can, right? What was left in the pack. Whitfield tells him, I want what belongs to me back. I'm going to be in the booth. I don't care who brings it up there. Just bring it up to the control booth and drop it back inside. If you don't, we're going to come in and we're going to tear this motherfucker apart. Somebody yells at the door. You can't tell him you brought cigarettes in, bitch. You can't tear nothing apart. Who said that? Who said that? Oh, you riding super dirty. Who said that? Who said that? Oh, you'll see. We'll tear this son bitch apart. He leaves out. Gets in the control booth. Sends the officer out, gets on the microphone. He said, I'm not playing. Whatever's mine, I want y'all to bring it up here and drop it. This is all over a pack of cigarettes. I want you to drop it in the control booth. Last warning. We're thinking, he's full of shit. He can't go tell these officers or anybody because he's just a sergeant. You got lieutenants, unit managers, you know, you can, captains, wardens, assistant wardens. Your country ass better not go tell nobody you brought cigarettes in here and that the inmates got them up off you because you dropped them and now you want to search everybody because you brought something illegal in the prison. You could lose your job. You will lose your job if you're caught in possession of cigarettes in the prison because the first thing they're going to think is, oh, you're passing out cigarettes to the inmates, right? Whitfield will leave out the booth. I'm out there in the day room, bullshitting some people. It's later that evening. We done ate our, our evening chow and then the night time's coming up. He should have been gone. His shift is over. Should have left at 5.30, 6 o'clock with 5.30 count. Door slides open. In comes Whitfield. My four or five officers with him. They're all putting on gloves. Rubber gloves. Because apparently you got to wear rubber gloves because, you know, you catch something from us. But I do understand the rubber gloves part. There's some nasty motherfuckers in prison. And you do not want to touch some of the shit that you need to touch. Some of these dudes don't bathe. They're not with the water sports. Some of these dudes are just nasty. Just a lot of weird shit that you might come across, right? They start at cell one and they start tearing shit up. Whitfield calls the first two men out the cell, walks up and sniffs them. <laughs> Sniffing their clothes, see if they smell like cigarettes. Now go ahead, give it up, give it up. Now other guards don't really know what he's talking about because he's not saying like give up cigarettes. He's saying whatever y'all got that's illegal, Give it up, give it up, give it up, right? He went through that whole pod. Accused several people of smelling like cigarettes. Crazy part is the guys he accused of smelling like cigarettes didn't even smell like cigarettes. Dudes that washed their hands, took their clothes, rinsed them out in the sink. Like, dude, convicts, you're not going to catch a slipping like that, right? Writes a couple different people charges for a little bullshit he finds in a cell. Nothing tobacco related. He took an L on that, right? Everybody's laughing like dummy, you know what I mean? He would still come through reeking of cigarettes. But after that, he was a whole different type of asshole. He was a whole new monster after he felt like he was the laughing stock of Seven Building. 
Like he, he's like, I know y'all know, I know y'all, but he would never say this stuff in front of another guard because he would have to expose what's going on, right? Whitfield is making our life a living hell. When I mean a living hell, if you knew he was on this shift, there is nothing you can do, you better do. You better not break out a tattoo gun. If you got wine, you better move into a crash test dummy cell because he is just in there every chance he gets randomly shaking down. He's not even looking for the cigarettes. No, he knows they're gone. He's just in there now. Oh, y'all want to fuck with me. Y'all want to fuck with me. Make me look stupid. I'll tear this bitch apart oh, on some on some Nino Brown type shit. You know what I mean? Do you know who I am? Like, just like, 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 like training day. Like, he's just Denzel. Remember I told you Whitfield's wife worked on the other side of the prison. I told y'all, when you're a piece of shit, or you do bad things in life, or you think you're going to do something and get over, it always ends bad. It always ends bad. So I tell y'all, don't get, don't commit crimes. Don't be out here doing dumb shit so that you end up locked up like my dumb ass did. Whitfield is one of those dudes that if you had to ask him to describe himself, he's an old school dude, he'd be like, I'm a Mac Daddy. You know what I mean? When the last time you heard somebody call himself a Mac Daddy? Like in the late 80s, early 90s, old pimp talk, right? Mac Daddy, I do that with the females. He would push up on every female guard that came through there. He didn't care if they were big, small, fat, skinny, black, white, old, young. Whitfield was trying to, you know, get his get his dipstick wet. He was, he was on these females. Several of them had complained about Whitfield, you know, and his actions he was cool with the lieutenant they didn't do anything about it right one of them really pushes it she goes to a place called atmore drive which is here in richmond which is the doc headquarters and files a sexual harassment complaint against sergeant whitfield so now sergeant whitfield really got an answer for this and where this shit took place at there was cameras so he caught the whole incident of whitfield being up on her brushing against her conversation him trying to you know get a little touchy touch on trying to think that him being a sergeant he could sleep with her and help her move her ranks up the way in the penitentiary system right we stopped seeing Whitfield and I told you we got what's called inmate.com inmate.com is where all the information comes from within the prison but there's no computer attached to it it's just this person hears it from a guard overhears these guards talking and tells this person and this person it's like gossiping is like the world wide web in there Whitfield gets fired for trying to sexually harass this this other guard Whitfield's wife works over in S1 continues to work in S1 and divorces Whitfield told y'all it always ends bad. It went from him being mad because somebody smoked up his smokes. He tried to smoke us behind it, tried to make our life a living hell. And at the same time, he wasn't living right. He wasn't doing right. He wasn't no stand-up officer. He should have never been a sergeant. He had a wife, bro. You got a whole entire wife. And you in here trying to holler at these little hood boogers, these little bugaboos, these little nobodies, you know what I mean? Like, he is hollering at some of the, some of these white chicks look like they came straight out of like the dirtiest trailer park you could imagine. Some of them look like they let their mama stop brushing their hair when they were seven. Some of these other chicks just look like that wasn't even a skin color, like they forgot to bathe. Some of these people didn't take the best care of themselves. Whitfield ain't care. Whitfield be right down on top of them. Like I said, he had no standards. The worst part of the matter is, once I realized I had to go to the infirmary one time for some stuff, and I seen who Whitfield's wife was, Whitfield's wife was bad. Light skin, you know, that good caramel complexion. Beautiful woman. And he's in here making our life a living hell and chasing around these little vagabond correctional officers. Be careful how you treat people. If you want to preach something, live by it. If you're going to talk about something, stand behind it. Don't say one thing and then do something else when ain't nobody else looking. He pretending to be a good man, 
pretended to be a good officer, pretended like he had, you know, abided by the rules. And in the end, his own stupidity got his dumb ass jammed up. Moral of the day story is, do right by people. Be a good person. And that's usually what will come back to you. Karma is real, but karma's also a bitch. You just better make that make sure that bitch is beautiful. You know, you don't want your karma to be ugly karma. Make sure it's beautiful karma. And you can do that by how you act every day. To anybody watching this and ain't ever been locked up, don't get locked up, please. If you're thinking about doing something stupid, or you think that what I'm talking about, you know, yeah, some of it's comical, yeah, some of it's crazy. But it's nothing you ever want to experience, man. I tell y'all all the time, I love each and every one of y'all, man. All the good people, I got nothing but love for you. Whether you love me or not. And I don't ever want to see y'all end up with a COG making your life a living hell. Or a Sergeant Whitfield pressing down on you day in and day out. Making what's already a bad situation even worse. This is your life. You only have one life to live. Regardless of what's going on at the moment, you do your best to make sure that every day you live your best life. Let's live life. But anyway, these detention centers, these jails, institutions, these facilities, they're all just crazier worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. Y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams, Let's Live Life. And to all my real ones, and all some real ones watching, because y'all still watching me. Y'all know how we do. Salute.